In humans, there's almost no data looking at tissue levels of NAD. Uh, what we have is the blood, the blood levels. Um, and in humans, it seems, it's clear that blood levels will about double if you're on one of the supplementation regimens for NR or NMN that's been used commonly. Can you summarize as much as you can about a orally supplemented or even injected of a NAD analogs? What is the effect on the blood that we have seen? So level of, on the blood of NAD, but also level in target tissues, because I know that some target tissue it can get and some are not, and you alluded it by uh, experiments that uh, Shiniman is doing. So can, can you try to elaborate a bit about that? Uh, and I'm just talking about levels right now. Yeah, so I mean, if, so I can elaborate on blood for humans and tissues for animals. So, I mean, we see okay. um, variable effects on the tissues and animals, but we certainly see boosting. So in the, in the liver, we'll see, you know, maybe five-fold increases uh, if we give a big bolus at one of these precursors. In the kidney, al almost that much as well, um, where in, in other tissues, it's a much more muted effect. So in skeletal muscle, it might see a 30 or 40% increase. Um, in the brain, a 30 or 40% increase. And in adipose, maybe 50% increase. Um, so it, it does really depend on, on which tissue you're looking at, with the kidney and the liver being sp yeah, specifically extremely responsive uh, in the gut to, a, to some degree as well. Um, in mice, the blood levels hardly ever move very much. Uh, we have a lot of trouble being able to show that blood NAD increases in mice, even though we've got the tissues and the tissues are through the roof in some cases. Um, in humans, there's almost no data looking at tissue levels of NAD. Uh, what we have is the blood, the blood levels. Um, and in humans, it seems, it's clear that blood levels will about double if you're on one of the supplementation regimens for NR or NMN that's been used commonly. And how do you explain it that in human you can see a nice increase in the blood in, and in mice you don't, but you see it in the target tissue? What is the scientific explanation for that? <laughs> yeah, we, we don't actually know how it's getting into those blood cells. I mean, part, part of this may be that a lot of the mouse studies uh, are much more acute, right? In many cases, the human blood we're looking at is after three months of supplementation. And, and in the mice, we're looking at a, a day or a couple of days. Um, mm. And so it may just be that it takes a while to build up in the blood. And we don't know if those red blood cells, if it's actually um, hematopoiesis, like if you have to wait for the precursor cell to have built up a lot of NAD and then produce more erythrocytes that are then what we're measuring. And so maybe maybe it just takes that long. Um, but yeah, we don't, we don't really know exactly what's going on. Yeah. And in the mice, it was only orally administrated or also injection into the bloodstream? Uh, we've done studies with injection into the bloodstream and looked at tissue levels, which do go much higher that way. Yeah. I don't know if we've ever measured, I can't recall ever measuring blood levels in a mouse from one of those experiments. Okay. You know, we only sort of recently realized that we should maybe care about the blood levels in the mice because that's the only accessible tissue in humans in many cases. Um, otherwise, yeah. you know, it seemed irrelevant in the mice because we, we can directly assess the target tissue. And, and I know that in humans, at least there are some uh, clinics uh, called longevity clinics that they uh, have some infusion of NAD uh, precursor to the blood. What is your opinion about that? <laughs> so there, I mean, I've struggled to find, there, there, I can, same with, with confidence now, I think that there, there's absolutely no scientific evidence for anything with that procedure. There's just never been a controlled study done, as far as I can tell, of any kind. Uh, and so uh, I, I just don't really know what to say uh, for, for that at the moment. Okay. Um, I can say that the it seems uh, like nobody has a clear articulation of what it's even for, to be honest. I've gone to a couple of those clinics and talked to people, and it's uh, primarily the one I was at. It was being used mainly to treat addiction. Right, rather than for longevity, even though it's become a little more fashionable now yeah. and people are taking it for sort of general health. But at that clinic, they were really uh, arguing that it, that it allowed you to, to get over addiction more easily if you were taking yeah. addictions. So if I will summarize it, it's cool, but there is no scientific evidence that it's doing anything. That's uh, fair to say? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, I also seen that uh, there are uh, some... Uh, instance that uh, some studies use a topical uh, NAD precursor and uh, w what is the use of those uh, topical uh, implication of uh, NAD plus uh, analogs? Um, so I think the, the major driver of people thinking about topical applications, I think, is that there was evidence uh, for a while now that, that nicotinamide 
uh, and nicotinic acid could uh, protect against skin cancer. Uh, yeah. Particularly these uh, keratinosis that form and as a, a precursor lesion to skin cancers were, were pretty dramatically uh, prevented in a couple of phase two and three clinical trials. Um, and, and so some of the studies that have investigated that started using topical formulations as well and showed that they also protected wherever you put them. Uh, and so I think that was the major driver behind people starting to think about putting them in skin creams. But uh, I, I think at this point also, there's probably also uh, quite a few unsubstantiated claims or, you know, because that's an easy indication to get a drug approval for as well. If you can do something topically, you don't have to spend as much time proving safety.